You forget this stuff. You'd go mad if you kept it all in your memory, wouldn't you, permanently? You never quite know when they're doing what they're told uh, on the front page of The Sun, for example, or, or, and whether they've gone a little bit further than perhaps they were told to go. But they're never going to take responsibility for anything they've done wrong. Hello, I'm James O'Brien, broadcaster and author of How Not To Be Wrong, The Art Of Changing Your Mind. And this is James O'Brien versus the government. I, I, I'm shaking hands. I was, at a, I was at a hospital the other night where I think there were, a few, there were actually a few coronavirus uh, patients and I shook hands with everybody, to, to the experts. But, but wash our, your hands. Judgment, our judgment is wash. Uh, washing your hands is the crucial thing. 3rd of March. That. I think it's astonishing to reflect on how much clarity and leadership has come into the equation since Boris Johnson was boasting about shaking hands with infected patients in hospitals. It's, it's the face of a, it's either Chris Whitty or Patrick Vallant, I don't think anyone can tell him apart anymore, but it's that sort of plaintive, what, what, what's your hand? What are we doing it? This guy. It's now uh, October and arguably he's even less clear and decisive about what we should and shouldn't be doing. It was just a couple of days ago that he said we had to be fearless but also use common sense. Please, please guys, here in Northern Italy we made one big mistake. Everybody kept saying it's just flu and now our intensive care units are collapsing. Everybody kept going outside like nothing happened and now our grandparents and parents are dying. Hashtag coronavirus is not hashtag flu. And that was March the 9th and reflects I, I, perfectly what was happening on my radio show at the time. It was almost as if we inhabited two parallel universes. Uh, Boris Johnson was trying to, I think, approach it as if it were a, an opponent on the rugby pitch. And of course, his supporters in this country were going along with it. And we were taking calls from Italy and, and elsewhere in continental Europe that were I mean, this curious mixture of bafflement and concern. I, do not beware of Italians bearing advice, seems to be the lesson we take away from this. A guy called Dominic Cummings, one of the Prime Minister's senior aides, who at the end of February outlined the government's strategy. Those present say it was, quote, herd immunity, protect the economy, and if that means some pensioners die, too bad. Herd immunity has never been the strategy, as I've made clear Your own repeatedly. chief scientific officer said on the radio to build up some degree of herd immunity as well so that more people are immune to this disease. Yeah, say what you like about Piers Morgan. Seriously, say what you like about Piers Morgan. And to have that clip ready, it, that, that for me in my last book I explained, that is the only way that you can really sort of fireproof yourself against misdirection and, and misinformation to play back either their own words or words that they've just commented. We're up to the 23rd of March now. Matt Hancock looks approximately 43 years younger. But there, there is a really crucial point there, which is at the beginning, the messaging was very different from what it is now. It became clear around about that time, perhaps shortly afterwards, that what they told us about PPE and possibly even testing had not been determined by following the science, but had been determined rather by the lack of preparedness and the knowledge that they didn't share, that we didn't have the PPE in place. And that's why shortly afterwards they ended up paying a ton of money to the Turkish equivalent of Del Boy Trotter for a plane full of PPE that no one was able to use. And they're all still in their jobs. From this evening, I must give the British people a very simple instruction. You must stay at home. Each and every one of us is now obliged to join together, to halt the spread of this disease, to protect our NHS, and to save many, many thousands of lives. So that was the 23rd of March. It is, I, I, it's funny at the time, it didn't really register that the, the seriousness that he's trying to convey is, is just not really there. And it was, what, 14 days previously that he was wanging on about shaking hands with infected patients in hospital. So he didn't say, oh, sorry, I shouldn't have done that. This is all he needs to do. If he'd said, oh, crikey, look at me, silly old Boris. I, I was shaking hands with patients not long ago. And, and I, I realise now what catastrophic conduct that was. No wonder Patrick Valence looked so crestfallen when I was uh, talking to you just two short weeks ago, but now I have grasped the full urgency of the situation and I have to tell, but he couldn't do that. So the, the second bit of the message is completely diluted by the absence of contrition or honesty in the first bit of the message. And uh, they're all still in their jobs. A, a tweet from Michael Gove now on the uh, 
24th of March, the day after the lockdown started. I wasn't clear enough earlier, apologies, to confirm while children should not normally be moving between households, we recognise that this may be necessary when children who are under 18 move between separated parents. This is permissible and has been made clear in the guidance. The point was, of course, that on breakfast television that very day, he'd said the opposite. And he's still in a job. Downing Street has just confirmed that the Prime Minister, Boris Johnson, has tested positive for a coronavirus. Uh, Boris Johnson uh, has coronavirus. It's the 27th of March now, and perhaps inevitable, um, certainly avoidable, and, and I think poignant, you know. I, I, we live in very tribal times when you're, you're supposed to derive pleasure from misfortune befalling the other side, whatever that may be. And I, I, this for me was a reminder of shared humanity. For me personally, I'd just recovered. I'd had a rough week where I couldn't really eat. I'd lost my sense of taste and my sense of smell. I didn't have the cough, but I, I, I know for a fact now, I've been tested subsequently for antibodies, I definitely had it. Something sort of really woke up inside me when David Cameron came forward to say he was confident that Boris Johnson would be able to overcome the coronavirus because he'd seen him play tennis. When, when Cameron said that, and I knew that the way to get over this virus was to, to lie down, flat on your back, maybe have an occasional mouthful of soup and do absolutely nothing, sleep, rest. The idea that you fight it, like you fight a tennis rival, um, it really, really worried me, actually. And I was supremely unsurprised when his condition escalated. Another tweet. Last night on the advice of my doctor, this is Boris Johnson, I went into hospital for some re routine tests as I'm still experiencing coronavirus symptoms. I'm in good spirits and keeping in touch with my team as we work together to fight this virus and keep everyone safe. That to me was supremely unsurprising and, and evidence once again of this really bizarre mindset that is absolutely everywhere in the British ruling classes and it's this idea that you, you don't acknowledge vulnerability, weakness, wrongness in any circumstances whatsoever. And it also led a lot of people watching when he thankfully came out of hospital to wonder whether it might have changed him. I think now that we're four or five months, six months further down the line, I, I think we can say with some confidence that it, it doesn't seem so far to have changed him at all. And, and that's a tragedy for him personally, but also of course, as the crisis continues, long after he promised or, 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 or suggested it would be over, it's a tragedy for the country as well. The Prime Minister's top adviser, Dominic Cummings, has denied doing anything wrong when he drove to his parents' home during the lockdown in March. I thought the best thing to do in all the circumstances was to drive to an isolated cottage on my father's farm. <sighs> he, he almost... There's a one look up to the sky there where you did wonder whether he was going, Christ, there's no way I'm going to get away with this. But he did. This following fast upon, of course, the revelation that Dominic Cummings uh, Boris Johnson's personal Rasputin had driven to, no, not only driven to Durham with his wife uh, and his young child in the back of the car after she had tested positive for coronavirus and while well, fearing that he had as well, but then having got to Durham, he had driven to a local beauty spot in, in Barnard Castle, I think a 60 mile round trip. By complete coincidence, it, it, was, um, it was a beauty spot that he visited on his wife's birthday. But what he was really doing was testing his eyesight because, you know, who here hasn't decided to test their eyesight by going for a 60 mile drive with the child in the back of the car? And you know, what better test could there be? Because of course, if your eyesight was dodgy, then you'd soon discover it. Something broke that day in the, in the context of the entire country because I don't share this uh, psychologically, but I've reported it and been told it by countless callers to my radio show. There's just this intu a subconscious sense that, well, it can't be as bad as they're telling it is because of what he did. And he didn't get into any trouble, so maybe I'll roll the dice. Maybe I'll take a chance. Maybe I'll go for a 60 mile drive to test my eyesight. Rishi Sunak now, Dishi Rishi, as Mr. Weatherspoons likes to call him. Taking care of your wife and young child is justifiable and reasonable. Trying to score political points over it isn't. But this is, this is ugly because this makes them all unsackable, you see. Because if you are Gavin Williamson, or you are Rishi Sunak, or you are Matt Hancock, or you are Priti Patel, or Dominic Raab, or any of the rest of them, the minute you stood behind Dominic Cummings' nonsense, in the, in the Downing Street Garden. Absolute nonsense. The minute you stood behind that, you 
sold what passes for integrity to the Prime Minister and in return you become as unaccountable as Dominic Cummings became that day. And if any of them get reshuffled, just start your stopwatches for how long it takes them to end up in the House of Lords. And it fell to an official blue-ticked UK civil service account to uh, speak for many people, presumably both in, in Whitehall and beyond, when they tweeted, arrogant and offensive, can you imagine having to work with these truth twisters? Um, it was subsequently deleted. And, and the mystery of Cummings, who's assumed a sort of weird status in, in the public consciousness, the mystery for me is what he's supposed to be good at. He got Brexit over the line by weaponizing xenophobia and putting a massive lie on the side of a bus. And that's great. And, you know, as a relatively upbeat and optimistic individual who always likes to see the best in people, I am wondering when we're going to have it explained to us precisely what it is that Dominic Cummings does that merits such levels of... Um, nation-damaging loyalty from the man ostensibly in charge of the entire country. The government's chief medical advisor has warned against large gatherings in hot weather after half a million people flocked to beaches in Bournemouth today. A major incident was declared in Bournemouth on what's been the hottest day of the year as roads became gridlocked and local services were stretched to their absolute limit. Do you know, I'm finding this oddly depressing. If, if you're wondering where my um, characteristic ebullience and uh, enjoyed the vivre or even Elan has gone. Um, I, I can't quite believe my eyes and I covered this every single day. Uh, and, and here we are again. You know, the public had already seen Dominic Cummings go out for the day and, and not get into any trouble and indeed argue furiously that he hadn't done anything wrong. So I, I was dismayed, perhaps cross, but it very, very hard to, to, to go in hard on people like this on these beaches because of the messages they were receiving. And, and my internal calendar is a little bit skewed, but I'm fairly confident this is around the time Boris Johnson said that we didn't need more detailed guidance because we could rely on good old fashioned British common sense as opposed to, I don't know, Thai common sense where there've been hardly any deaths at all. And, and then um, grab a drink and raise a glass. Pubs are reopening their doors from the 4th of July. Um, chinking pint pot emoji hashtag open for business and that's from Her Majesty's Treasury's Twitter account. It was shortly deleted afterwards because it was kind of celebrating and do you know again I, I, you forget this stuff you'd go mad if you kept it all in your memory wouldn't you permanently but this idea that they created deliberately a sense that we'd got to the finish line. The, 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 now I, the relationship between Downing Street and and the right-wing media is always uh, interesting you never quite know when they're doing what they're told uh, on the front page of The Sun, for example, or, or, and whether they've gone a little bit further than perhaps they were told to go. But they conspired, and this tweet suggests that it probably was uh, government policy, for want of a better word. They conspired to create this sense of celebration. So everyone piled out onto the streets to celebrate the, the anniversary of D-Day. And then similarly, 4th of July, we, we were all sort of supposed to treat it like a jubilee and run into the streets and start chinking our glasses. They deleted the tweet, but again, you know, no accountability, no apology, no um, explanation of, of why they got, or even acknowledgement of, of the fact that they'd got stuff so wrong. And then the pubs reopened and guess what happened? <laughs> Again, I, maybe uh, incorrectly, I don't feel much anger towards these individuals. They, they were invited to a party by the government. And so to give them a coating for then celebrating seems, seems a little unfair, but you know, it's a Petri dish that, isn't it? And, and that was the, the 4th of July. Again, it's the mixed messaging, it's the absence of uh, uh, clarity, consistency, leadership that creates this vacuum into which anything can move, including the sense that it would be appropriate to go and start you know, moonwalking up Old Compton Street. And now Kirsty Allsop, the, 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 the sage, of coronavirus. If your job can be done from home, it can be done from abroad where wages are lower. If I had an office job, I'd want to be first in the queue to get back to work and prove my worth to my employer. I am terrified by what could be on the horizon for so many, which to be fair to Kirsty Allsop was a fairly prevalent position. Quite what it was driven by, we probably didn't dig down into enough. If, if I 
had been interviewing any of the big cheeses who were shouting from the rooftops that everybody had to get back to the offices, I'd have been very interested to know how much commercial property they had in their portfolios because big cities, central locations uh, at this point had been completely filleted despite the fact that most employers reported that working from home hadn't neg impacted negatively upon their workers' productivity. So, so for me there was a big disconnect here, quite symptomatic of the whole malaise. We were being shouted at by people in my profession, by people like Kirsty, by politicians, get back to work, get back to work, which obviously overlooked two simple facts. Most of us were working from home. You can't get back to work if you're already working. We were just not in our usual workplace. So it was a, a, a confected controversy of postcodes. And the second element of it, of course, was that it, it's a public health issue. It, it's not a, a matter of, you know, what did she say, being uh, desperate to get back to work and prove my worth to my employer. By what? Getting sick, like the Prime Minister did? It, it, it's not a personal attack on her, because many, many voices chimed in similarly, but it was September when all the schools went back and the universities went back, and we'd kind of flirted with a uh, uh, cautious return to offices for, for a lot of companies, and lo and behold, the infection rate started skyrocketing again. And I don't know that we've heard from Kirsty Allsop since. Uh, the blame game began. I, I, it was pretty obvious. People often pat me on the back for my predictions, but between you and me, they're, they're not very hard to do. They're never going to take responsibility for anything they've done wrong themselves. Unlike, for example, Macron, um, I think Merkel has uh, acknowledged missteps, but here, here's the British government. Matt Hancock blames the British public for getting too many coronavirus tests, and the Prime Minister says not enough people are booking coronavirus tests. Riddle me that. Do you know what it is? Whether it's deliberate or not, I don't know, but Donald Trump does it a lot as well. Take a coin, toss it in the air, shout heads and tails, and then however it lands, do a lap of honour. That's American and British politics 2020. And now, I can't believe you've put this on the computer. This is, this is I've been trolled. I've been trolled by my colleagues at Penguin. This is, this is the man who, probably more than any other, defined my teenage years. The man to whom I, I would previously have followed into war. I speak of King Monkey himself, Ian Brown, lead singer of the Stone Roses, who, who kind of followed Jim Corr down the skeptics route and started tweeting by September the 5th, no lockdown, no tests, no tracks, no masks, no vax. So he hasn't lost his lyrical dexterity, but he appears to have lost his mind. I still love you, Ian, but indicative perhaps of what happens when you get your news off your Auntie Doris's Facebook page instead of dull sometimes and flawed certainly, but reliable and decades old news organisations. Public Health England have admitted tonight that nearly 16,000 cases of coronavirus between the 25th of September and the 2nd of October were not included in daily figures for that period and not transferred to the contact tracing system. This was an astonishing story that turns out to be about Excel, about spreadsheets. The data dropped off a metaphorical cliff because the software was, was decades old in some cases. It's hard to believe this has all happened in a single year. It's all the same story. Do you remember Etch a Sketch? It's like the, the latest debacle shakes the etcher sketch of the last debacle and we've all forgotten about it so thanks yeah thanks a lot for inflicting this cavalcade of chaos and catastrophe on me because i was i was in a relatively good mood when i got here cheers thank you for watching this to subscribe to penguin click here and to find my book click on the link in the description take care